ever faithful God. For us and our salvation, your beloved Son came from heaven to earth to embody your love and to give his all for us, even death on the cross. May we respond to this grace by giving Jesus our complete allegiance and being his committed disciple in everything we say and do. Praying in his precious name, Christ the Lord. Amen. And Jesus said, Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus finished washing the disciples' feet, he gave them and us, yes, this new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he preaches, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you were to ask me to summarize, summarize my entire theology, all that I believe about God in three words, I would answer you, God is love. God is love. Love explains the God who created everything good. Love explains the God who redeems humanity from sin and death. Love explains the God whose spirit lives in each of us right now and prompts our faith and calls us, yes, to be disciples instruments, channels of God's love. God's love explains Jesus' birth, ministry, healings, teachings, crucifixion, suffering, death, and glorious resurrection. About now, you might be wondering where I'm going with all this. We hear large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned to them and said, whoever comes to me and does not hate, hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. How in the world can Jesus, God's love in flesh and blood, call his followers, us included, to hate our parents or siblings or spouses or even our, our precious children? Jesus says to us that we are to love our enemies but hate our families. 
What's that all about? What is Jesus thinking here? Two thoughts. First, as Jesus speaks these words, he is pressing, pressing on to Jerusalem. There he will give his all, his everything, even his life for your redemption and for mine. So Jesus' cross of suffering and sacrifice and death now looms very much in his thoughts as in his future. In this reading, Jesus, therefore, wants to get the attention, the undivided attention of the throngs of people who are following him. And he gets their attention using a technique that's called hyperbole. Hyperbole, which means driving a point home with extreme exaggeration. I don't really believe that Jesus actually wants us to sell our every possession and give all the money to the poor. What good is done if we are then, we are then in poverty? Rather, I hear Jesus saying, in Jerusalem, I'm going to give up, give up my everything for you. Therefore, yes, I expect as much from those who say they are my disciples. If the choice came down to choosing between following me or holding on to all your possessions, I expect, I, Jesus, expect you to choose me. Or, or on much less note, would we be willing, would we be willing to give up our cell phone for Jesus? And so also, our relationship to Jesus, our relationship to him as the Lord and Savior of our life, has to be more important and more valued than any other relationship, even, yes, even with our spouse, parent, sibling, or child. Jesus knows full well that what he is asking of those who would be his disciples is painfully and sacrificially difficult. And that's why he asks his listeners, take a moment and count the cost of what it will mean to be his follower before they sign up and come aboard. A careful builder, Jesus says, never breaks ground without taking a good, hard look at their budget, a wise general doesn't declare war unless she's sure her troops are fully equipped and battle ready. And the life of faith is no different. We have to count the cost. Being Christ's disciple is not a weekend hobby, not a Sunday pastime. It's a full soul, full body, full mind commitment. And it demands, it demands that we turn away from whatever or whoever stands in the way of us having a full relationship with Jesus and a full, a full commitment to him. And then that second thought. Here, biblical scholar and commentator Fred Craddock has helped me tremendously in understanding Jesus' use of the word hate. Hate here, as in hate father and mother, husband, wife, and children. Craddock says that the way 
paint is used by Jesus here is as a Semitic expression, which means, which means to turn away or, or to detach oneself from. It is not at all the same as our contemporary expression, I hate you. By hate, Jesus means here an action, not an emotion. Just as when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he's not asking that we have a, a warm, fuzzy, emotional love for our enemies, but instead that we act on their behalf, that we do right by them, that we do good for them, that we act on behalf of their welfare. Jesus is saying here that he wants us he wants us to turn away from anything or anyone that stands in the way of our com complete commitment to him. <laughs> Recently, and I've had a lot of time to do some reading. <laughs> Recently, I, I read a fascinating article about a current phenomenon prompted by the pandemic. It's called quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. Have any of you heard about, okay, quiet quitting? Good. Quiet quitting is a current rage on the internet. It means you haven't, you haven't quit your job, but you've chosen to do the bare minimum of what's expected of you in your job. Quiet quitting means not working, not working above and beyond, oh no. Refusing to excel, not going the extra mile at work. Now being Christ's disciple isn't a job, but, but, and I'm deeply, I'm truly saddened to say this, there are far too many Christians out there who are quiet quitters. Their response to the gift of God's extravagant, undeserved, lavish, and incomprehensible grace, God's lavish love and unbounded mercy is, putting it mildly, lukewarm. half-hearted, casual, a take-it-or-leave-it faith. By way of example, I'll attend Mass if I have nothing better to do. Such an attitude is an affront to grace. It cheapens God's grace. God's grace is priceless. It comes to us without price and without end. But we must never treat it cheaply. God's gift of grace to us is free, freely given. We can do absolutely nothing to earn it, nothing. But it's not cheap. It cost God the life of God's Son. And this grace calls for our, our undivided and our undiluted, undivided and undiluted commitment, making God our number one priority. Going the extra mile, the extra mile, or two, or three, in our discipleship. If I hear Jesus teaching in this gospel reading correctly, Jesus is rejecting quiet quitting discipleship. This coming Tuesday, praise God, this community of faith will mail out 2,000 postcards that will invite the unchurched in the communities surrounding this sanctuary 
to come and worship with us and fellowship with us. As visitors come, please, please go out of your way to welcome them and make them feel they have found, yes, a church home and a family. But that isn't enough. We need ushers and greeters at both of our entrances to welcome them. Every member here can serve as an usher greeter. So please, I implore you, volunteer and let Bill know of your willingness to serve. Let us not be quiet quitter disciples. Choir rehearsals resume this Tuesday evening, 5 p.m. Come, try it, you might like it. Your voice is very much needed. You, you can make a difference. You can increase the joyful song we raise to God. Also in the side vestibule, there is a sign-up sheet. I think, Jean, it's for the next four months. September through December. Yep, September through December. For you, yes, you, you to host a fellowship gathering one Sunday following the worship service. Anybody can do it. You don't even have to bake. Buy the donuts or the fruit. Don't be, don't be a quiet quitter disciple. And also we need acolytes. Oh, how we need acolytes. And I will make certain that you know exactly what to do before you serve as acolyte your first Sunday. That's my promise to you. So tell me of your willingness. As best we are able, the time, the time has come for us to put this horrid pandemic behind us. We need to renew our congregational life right now, and therefore we need you. Fewer quiet quitter disciples and more committed disciples. Jesus, in this reading, is calling us to above, to above, and beyond faith. Our discipleship needs to be an extra mile discipleship. True Christian discipleship is never, ever a spectator sport. The Christ we call the Savior and Lord is the complete opposite of the quiet quitter. On Calvary's cross, he gave his everything for us. He lavishes his amazing grace upon us, but then calls us to give our all, our all, our all for him as disciples. Will we say a resounding, yes, yes, Lord, to his call? Or will we be a quiet quitter? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.